much. Uh, it's always wonderful to be here. I think the best part about being in RSC is that you get to meet so many expert surgeons, vibrant residents, and technical es experts in robotic surgery all under one roof. I don't think there's any other place that you can do that. And uh, in spite of being the opening batsman of the innings today, I see a full stadium. That is, I think, very, very unusual, and I'm very happy and grateful for that. So the talk that uh, I'm going to talk about is learning curve in robotic surgery. And we always use this term very often whenever we talk about robotic surgery or we talk about, for that matter, any surgery. But what really does a learning curve mean? And what are the implications of learning curve when it comes to robotic surgery? So if you, if you go by the bookish definition of learning curve, it's basically the rate of a person's progress in gaining experience or new skills. And as you would understand, it would apply to every single discipline that you may be in. It would apply to a, learning a musical instrument. It would apply to learning a sport. Every single thing is involved when it comes to learning curve. And typically, the learning curve would be like this, something like this. It's an S-shaped curve. Initially, you may be putting in a lot of effort, but that effort is not really bearing fruit in the sense that you're accumulating the skills, but they are not showing. So it's a slow beginning. And then suddenly, there comes a time when the results start showing. You start doing better. And that's the steep acceleration phase, and you acquire a new skill rapidly. Uh, then when you become a so-called expert, there is a Plato phase, and you may not be able to progress very at a great speed, but at the same time, you are becoming better with time. A different and perhaps a more interesting way to look at learning curve is the levels of learning. You start off with unconscious incompetence. I am bad, but I don't realize that I am bad. And then suddenly, after doing some cases, I realize, oh, I am really bad. And then, ultimately, you can do a robotic prostatectomy in four hours. The results are reasonably good, but, but you have to put your mind, heart, and soul into it. You have every single step that you do, you have to put your heart into it, and you have to make sure that you're fully there. And then there comes a time after some time that you're doing a good job, but you don't even realize that you're doing a good job. I think for all of us, the ultimate aim should be to reach from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence. But there will be you know, a path to follow for that. So more important than the learning curve may be the forgetting curve. Even if you are listening to me right now with rapt attention, within 20 minutes of my finishing this talk, you would have forgotten 50% of what I said. And in about, say, a month or so, you would probably remember only one or two points that I said, so about 20% of what I'm saying today. And that's true for every single thing. That's something that we have learned right from school times when we had to mug up our course books. And this is true for robotic surgery. The only way that you can overcome the forgetting curve is to do constant repetition. And there also has to be a finite time in which you have to repeat those particular things. You may have done 100 robotic prostatectomies or 100 ro robotic ga gastric bypass. But if you are doing one case in a month, Versus if you're doing those 100 cases with one case or two cases every week, there's a huge difference as far as the learning curve is concerned. Learning curve is not just a function of the number of cases, but the time duration in which you're doing it. Of course, there are different types of learning curve. There is a short learning curve, a long learning curve. But ultimately, the types of learning involve not just the individual. So you have an individual learning curve. So you may be able to do a very good job at, on the console in whatever surgery is that of your choice. But what ultimately matters is organizational learning. So ultimately, whether your patient goes home and has good outcomes depends not on how good a work you've done on the console. It certainly depends upon it, but that's just one point about it. It also depends upon how well your nurse practitioner is taking care of the patients in the ward. It depends upon your bedside surgeon, how good and competent he is. It depends upon the person who cleans your operating room to make sure that there's no infection in, in your patients. It depends upon the technical expert who's setting up your robot. Every single person is important. That's the only way that the organizational learning curve can be, uh, you can go through that. Now, how to 
shorten the organizational learning curve and, the re and how to do that is number one proper selection of workers don't be in a hurry to select your team find out the right person for the right job give them proper training expose them to other experts who may be able to train them better than you in certain aspects motivate them you can make the best and the most sincere worker into a non-worker by screaming and shouting at them all the time. So you have to motivate them. They should be partners to your success rather than just stepping stones to it. Your, your, your teammates need to feel a part of your success as a robotic surgery team. Of course, work specialization is very important. If somebody is doing a particular job well, you have to keep on repeating the job that he is doing. You have to provide quick and easy access for help. Always have a patient here. Let them come back to you in case they have any problem. And allow workers to help redesign their own tasks. I want the surgery done exactly like this. I want the ports placed exactly like this. Not one centimeter here, not one centimeter there. Well, you may say that you are standardizing the procedure, but you're also curtailing free thinking. Experiment. Let them come out with their own solutions. Give them a problem, let them solve it. Learning curve in robotic surgery is very, very difficult to quantify and I'm not even going to get there. The reason is that which criteria are you following? Is it about the fact that you know, the patient is alive at the end of the surgery like Dr. Bhandari says very often? Or is it something that you have managed to preserve good continence, restricted blood loss? What is really the criteria you're selecting? Which surgery you're talking about? Doing a robotic cholecystectomy has to be easier than doing a robotic hemicolectomy. That's just the nature of the surgery. Which patient, obesity, previous surgery, all these impact the learning curve of the surgeon. And which surgeon? All of us learn at our own pace and we have to respect that. And ultimately the idea is that everybody can learn robotic surgery, but everybody will take their own time doing it. So how to overcome it? There's a lot of controversy about whether laparoscopy helps in becoming better robotic surgeons. I think there is, this has been finally put to rest because it has been shown that at least in the simulation setting, people who did laparoscopic simulation did better at robotic simulation. Now it's not essential to be a robotic surgeon, to be a laparoscopic surgeon, to be a good robotic surgeon and we have a lot of evidence all over the world for that. But I do think that you can transfer your skills from one platform to the other. So even if you don't have access to the robot, just keep on working on your surgery. When you get hold of the robot, you're going to get, become much better at it. Video recording and feedback. I think we have to use technology to be able to become better and it has been shown by Jim Hu and his colleagues that those surgical residents who uploaded their videos on the internet and invited expert reviews in an anonymous fashion actually did better over time as compared to those who did not. And there are now online platforms available. I'm fortunate to be one of the reviewers for an online platform which is called CSATS wherein you can upload your video and you have to provide a feedback. The, the reviewers have to provide a feedback in terms of certain robotic surgery skills and also in terms of giving suggestions regarding what is the surgeon doing good and how he can improve it. And this feedback can greatly help in overcoming the learning curve initially. And lastly, there is no doubt that proctoring and mentoring plays a major role. But I would stress again that to overcome the learning curve, it's not just proctoring the surgeon, it's proctoring the entire surgical team. Whenever I have the opportunity to go anywhere to you know, help out some other surgeons, I always make sure that I'm taking at least one of my teammates so that the entire OT experience can be smooth and the transfer of skills can be there, not only on the console, but at the bedside and during the setup also. So, learning curve is variable and we have to accept that. The role of the team cannot be overemphasized and you have to involve the entire team in your learning curve. Mentoring and proctoring play a very important role. Laparoscopic training is transferable. So go ahead and spend your time on lab simulators. It'll make you a better robotic surgeon. And ultimately, using technology, video feedback may be the key to becoming better robotic surgeons and better robotic surgical teams. Thank you very much.